Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel today. We've got a very, very special video and interview with Dr. Chris Martinson. So he is the founder and CEO of Peak Prosperity. And if you haven't seen his crash course before, you've got to watch that or even his book, The Crash Course. I watched it a couple of years ago, actually, now, Chris, and I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Highly, highly recommend it to everyone. So, Chris, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Neil. It's really good to be here with you. I know we've done a little bit in the past, but I'm looking forward to doing a lot more because our brains seem to to uh, track pretty carefully with each other, you know, coming at it from different angles. And in science, that's consilience. When you have different people, different methods tracking and you end up in the same spot, that's consilience. I love that because um, it, it means uh, I'm probably on the right track, you know? Yeah, yeah. And as usual, we're going to be talking about some fairly controversial topics today. But what we're going to do, we're going to keep the video on YouTube uh, fairly short. We're not going to go into the very controversial stuff. That stuff we're going to be doing on our own platform. So Chris has a private platform, as do I. And that's where we're going to go into some of the stuff that we're not uh, permitted. Um, even It's crazy, isn't it, Chris? Even now that we're still not permitted to talk about a lot of this stuff um, on a lot of these platforms. So that will be in our private platforms, and it will be a much longer extended interview. This is going to be, I think this is probably going to be the longest one that we've done. So uh, looking forward well to that. Isn't that fascinating? You and I live in countries that fancy themselves to be democracies and a cornerstone of a democracy is free speech. And somehow we don't actually have the luxury of that. So but but there is a solution. So we I speak totally freely behind my my closed doors, as it were. And that's what I need to do. And and, and that's OK, too, because it keeps the trolls out. And we have a we have great conversations, just like I know you do. Yeah, you too. Yeah. Oh, the, the trolls love me, Chris. They love my channel. <laughs> <laughs> great. OK, well, let's get started then. So I want to kick off then with there's, I mean, there's so much that we can talk about today that, that there really is. Um, but I really want to kick off with talking about one of the things I think you specialize in and one of the things that we just don't talk about enough on my channel, and that's energy. And even though I've got a good background, I've researched it in detail and I've really looked into energy, I feel like you do it a lot more justice than I do because you've you've done your crash course, you've really studied energy to such a deep deep level. And I'd really love for you to talk and sort of educate the viewers from your perspective on, on energy and the oil, peak oil and the energy cliff that I think we're heading towards. So if I, let me just throw something out there and, and I'd love to get your, your feedback and thoughts on this. So I've been saying for a long time that we're heading towards this sort of energy cliff or, or with fossil fuels, although I don't like that name, but I really feel as though we're heading towards an energy cliff with that and we've sort of we're getting we're getting through all that easy to reach energy and now we're sort of hitting this new plateau before a downward do you agree with that do you have different thoughts on that you know uh neil it's a great question and in fact if i could give people like one thing if people said you know just you only have one chance to put something in my head what would it be and it's this idea of putting on what I call energy goggles, right? It's like that scene in the matrix where suddenly Neo can see the green code everywhere. Mm. And all of a sudden things become more controllable, predictable, understandable, and he becomes more powerful. To me, if you put the energy goggles on and you look at a city or what's in the market today or what's just sitting around you in your house, when you put the energy goggles on, all you see is the energy, right? It took energy, 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 and not just any energy, but fossil fuels, poorly named, such as it is oil, gas, coal, right? These are the things that really give us prosperity. And I think once people put their goggles on, they have a chance to see that. So great. These things have delivered a, just a huge amount of prosperity. People today, myself included, especially live these ridiculously amazing, easy lives compared to almost any other time in human history. And I would like to see that continue if we could. So when we look at this, what, what, what are we talking about? So there's a little subtlety here, and and it's not just the amount of oil you get out of the ground, and that's what they report on. Like there's 98 million barrels per day of liquids being sold. That's what that's the headline number. But the number that's more important is, well, how much net energy are we getting out of that oil? This is where the story becomes both 
predictive and maybe a little alarming for people once you understand actually what that means. And it means this. If I have to use 100 barrels of oil, manufacturing the drill rigs and putting in the fuel tanks of all the workers that come there and growing their food and the roads, like there's all these derivative things that re are required it's just so I can put that drill rig, punch a hole in the ground, get oil to come out. If I have to use 100 barrels to get 100 barrels out of the ground, my net return is a big fat goose egg. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens. And we could do that activity. We could keep drilling and getting oil to use oil to get oil, but nothing else happens. No plane flights, no food grown and transported, nothing. So what we really care about in this story is not, do we have 100 million barrels coming out of the ground, but how much is left over? And that's where the story gets really interesting because today, here in 2023, when we're talking, the world is living on the oil that was really drilled in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. High net energy stuff, 100 to 1 returns. Use a barrel, get 100 back, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Gawar field in Saudi Arabia, put a straw down. It's like just 1,200 feet down. And whoo, you have this well that might produce 3,000 barrels a day for 50 years, right? It's just this astonishing return. And that's not where we're at. I know in the UK, they're starting, they've tried some of these horizontal wells in the shale to see what's going on. We're doing the same thing in the United States, drilling up this shale oil. Brilliant technology, amazing people working it, not going to take a single thing away from that. But the wells now, we drill down 10,000 feet, sideways for another 10,000 feet yeah. potentially, and we get maybe 1,000 barrels a day um, for the first month, but within three years, it's gone down 85%, and we're down to maybe 20 barrels a day. Yeah. So that's the world we live in, and, and that story of 10,000, 10,000, and 85% decline too much detail. It doesn't have the same net energy. So we're replacing high net energy oil with slow, lower net energy oil. It's a, it's a, it's a mixing function, right? But we're in the middle of that mixing function. And if you understand the story, you understand that all our prosperity came from that net energy. And I think your, your viewers would agree. It's just fine. It's getting harder and harder and harder to get economic growth. Where did it go? And wait a minute, it's budgets don't go as far. There's all this confusing detail that to me resolves mm -hmm. when you understand that we don't have the net energy to support how easy it was 20 years ago, right? right, right. It's just a different world. Yeah. So I think we, we're, we're aligned with that then. The return on investment just isn't what it used to be. I think we can, we, we can agree with that. We see it connects to a lot of other things. I often talk about GDP how your gross domestic product really if you think about it and i don't you know it's probably a year ago now maybe nine months i, I made a forecast that just watch what happens with germany you're going to see some problems with germany because where does a lot of their energy come from it's it's russia you know natural gas things mm -hmm. like that so you're going to start to see some issues coming down the line with with a, a lot of europe which again you link the energy to the gdp and that's where you get your growth from. How have a lot of Western countries grown so rapidly? It's the energy input. So, but here's the other thing, and, and we can move on to this. We can talk more on, on the energy side. But the, the thing that I think people are missing, and they're really, really missing, is the food, the food aspect. So they don't realize that you think, I mean, you can go back, um, I think you love history just as much as I do, Chris. And you start mm -hmm. looking at all the different empires and you look at the first you know, energy revolution, the second you get industrial revolution and you actually look at, at that. Well, it was heavily on energy input and different forms of energy. And we really took off as a society when we discovered oil. But if you think even before that, we can uh, wood or coal is a good one. But but wood, you think of the Roman Empire and the amount of wood that they use and it enables an empire to create more food. So we've also had, if you think not just the oil and we have the diesel, which powers the combine harvesters. And uh, I always make the joke when I hear people saying, you know, oh, we need to stop these combine harvesters they're using you know, using all these fossil fuels, we need, we need a solar. And I said, sorry, sorry, yeah, let me just clarify, a solar powered combine harvester, just 
just think that through for a second. <laughs> no batteries. No, no, no. They want the sun, the sun to hit these solar panels. It's never going to happen. These heavy <laughs> industry. And, and this is the other thing. We'll, we'll, let's connect food. We'll connect war. So mach- war equipment. What does that run on? That is that is diesel. A lot of these tanks. I mean, some of the, um, what is it? The Abram tank, I think that you have in the US. Doesn't that run on jet fuel or something? I think it can run as a secondary, right? <laughs> 60 tons of metal that has to go from A to B somehow. Yeah, exactly. So we, I, I just don't think, and then I'd love to get into the ESG and the restrictions via the investment into new wells and uh, drilling and, and all this as well. I think this is, we, we've got so much to talk about here, but the food, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the food. Cause I've talked about this a lot, but I'd love to get your thoughts on how the energy has created and we you can go into fertilizers, whatever you want to, um, the amount of food that we have today, just how closely correlated is that Chris? Oh, it's, it's so much to unpack there and great questions, Neil, of course, 10, Here's a number 10. I'm going to get to this number in just a second. But I think we can all intuitively understand that like if a cheetah is going after some Impala and it has to burn a thousand calories, but it drags down 500 calories of Impala, it's on the losing end of this story and eventually it's going to die, right? If it has to run that transaction. So food all the way up until about the 1920s for all of human history, I mean, hundreds of thousands of years of humans grubbing around for food and then growing it finally, it was always a net positive energy activity, just like for the cheetah, it had to be, right? So up through about the 1920s, farming was a net positive activity, meaning a farmer would put in through muscle power, their own, maybe an oxen or maybe a light tractor, um, and they would put in one calorie of, of energy into that, whether it's muscle energy or a light tractor, and you would get 10 calories back. So that's a net positive activity, and it's fun, and the old kingdoms were always just sort of an architecture of like, um, how big of a footprint could you put down that was net positive? Because the the serfs were out there making your energy, which was food. It was very direct. Everybody understood that. 200 years ago, anybody wanders into your town, they say, who's the richest person in town? They point to the person with the most land because the land was our energy collector, was our solar harvester. And that was very direct. Things. This is something people really need to understand because we've lost the plot line. But today, that 10 is a minus 10, meaning that we lose money, energy, growing food at this point in time. Shouldn't mm-hmm. have said money, it's a derivative product. But now we spend 10 calories, mostly of fossil energy, for that one calorie to show up on my plate. And I love it that it does, Neil. I mean, I love that I walk into a store and there's brisket and grapes and all kinds of stuff. It's fabulous. But we spend 10 fossil fuel calories so that one grape calorie can show up from Chile in February on my plate, right? Mm. So this is unsustainable. Or at a minimum, as adults in a conversation, we should be saying when, not if, but when we no longer can subsidize our food calories with fossil fuels, what's the plan? Is it nuclear? Is it these solar panels I keep hearing about? If so, show me how that works because we don't yet have any means of turning electrons from solar or wind into nitrogenous fertilizers. That loop has not been closed. Nobody's shown how we would do that. It's almost entirely manufactured from natural gas. So again, we're just out here, 8 billion people eating fossil fuels, no plan for how we're going to alter that relationship. And this is why when we get down to it right now, I'm very worried about food over the next several years. Me too. Because of the fertilizer issue, which we can talk about more if you yeah. want to go there. But it's just, yeah. I think people need to understand the basics of the system. I mean, that's what I talk about in the crash course. It's all mm-hmm. systems. Like if you, once you see how the systems come together, the most common reaction is people go, wait a minute, why isn't anybody talking about that? That seems important. And it's, it's, it's bizarre, but that's why you and I talk about it. Cause you know what? There's a vacuum right now yeah, about yeah. this official vacuum, I should say. Mm. No, the, the fertilizer. And, and let me just plug your course a second, Chris, because the, the crash course is wonderful. You know, I always tell everyone, I, I post it in my private community as well. In fact, it's been a while. I should post it again, that people should watch that crash, uh, crash course. You, you really did do a, a great job with that. Now, now let's yeah let's talk about the first. And, if, and if i could plug one thing yeah. this is the old version this came out in 2011 but mm. um 
just this week, the updated version, I spent all summer rewriting it, so there's a revised edition of the Crash Course coming out, and if people buy it, um, that makes my head get bigger. I love that. Thank you much. But it, it also <laughs> helps it potentially get on a bestseller list, and I think more people need to know about what's in here. Mm -hmm. There. I, that's my plug. Great. Yeah, no, no. Plug away. You deserve it. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk then about, I mean, I've got so many talking points. I, I, there's so much on here. Where to even start? But since we're on the topic of energy and we're talking about fertilizers as well, again, I don't really think people appreciate just the power of fertilizers, but also the natural gas. And I remember I, you know, you talked about how people troll a lot. Well, you, you know, I am the ultimate sort of troll attractor, believe me. <laughs> but but even worse, I get it in real life. So if I'm, you know, out in the mm. street, I have I actually have people come up to me. I've had it three times now. I've had some very awkward um, encounters, let's just say. Uh, so, uh, you know, I've been there. So fertilizers, I don't think people really appreciate and, and the amount of sort of negative comments when I talk about fertilizer. And I say, you realize where all this fertilizer comes from. It comes from Russia. It comes from this sort of region a lot of it and even if it's not made there which a lot of it is and it's shipped in even if you're making it in europe for example well you need that natural gas and that natural gas is cheapest see people they haven't really connected a lot of these dots together i feel like my subscribers have i think probably your subscribers has because if they watch you uh, watch me they're, they're obviously awake they're quite intelligent people is my view just even when i meet people as well in real life they tend to be very sort of they question things they don't just take whatever narrative is put out to them and we've got a, mm -hmm. a lot of narratives going on at the moment even ufos now ufos and all sorts of uh mm -hmm. you know, crazy stuff but no that the fertilizer is so important because you, you look what happened with sri lanka and again, I forecast that way, way before I said, just watch the WEF experiment, which is Sri Lanka, is going to backfire. They are going to collapse because they and I think it could have been done a lot better. They, they could, there was a way that it could have worked, but they did it in the wrong way. They, they, they just completely did it in the wrong way. And they tried to go all natural overnight. And it just didn't work. And you've seen the result now, the, the collapse of the government there. But even worse, mm -hmm. you've seen right um, this week, really, the announcement. I don't know if you saw the UK food crisis has begun. So uh, they've run out of vegetables. A lot of different vegetables have run out of. And part of what they're saying is true, but part of it is pure propaganda. So they're talking about, oh, it's because of, you know, global warming. They love to say global warming and climate change. But actually, if you look at where some of this veg is grown, it's not in Africa and Spain and some of this stuff that they're talking about. And again, well, you know what I do, Chris. I actually go to the store. I buy the veg and I go, that says Netherlands. <laughs> and that's the key word. There it here. is. There it is. Yep. Uh, so Again, this was one I took a lot of heat for this video, but I said, we're going to see a vegetable crisis coming down the line because in the Netherlands, they have these, I don't know if you've ever been, Chris, but they, these mm -hmm. greenhouses are absolutely, they're a marvel of engineering of, of, of this, you know, this world we live in now. They are absolutely just incredible. And you see what they grow in there. And then they have to pump in the CO2. They have to get all the, you know, fertilizers and everything else in there. Well, what was what actually happened was the government said, no, 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 no. You're causing all this this um, climate change and everything else. And you're pumping in CO2 and we're going to tax you on the CO2. So there was a double hit. And we can link this to the double hit with GDP as well. So the, what was the double hit? The double hit was natural gas they use for energy mm -hmm. to heat the greenhouse and the CO2, and oh, actually it's a triple hit, and the fertilizers. So they get hit with all three. So what is their option? They close down for a while. They pause production until things start to improve, because they're not going to, I mean, this is a capitalistic society. They're not going to lose money. So they pause, 
And that's what we've seen. So now you have this knock on effect and the government and the media says, oh, it's because of, you know, it's too hot because of global warming in Spain and all this other stuff on oh, Africa and stuff. Part of it may be, you know, it may be true, but but the bulk of it is they're just not growing. They've, they're having a lot of issues. And again, we can link this to ESG. But I'd love to know your thoughts on on what I said there. And have you got anything to add to that? Oh, no, it's just it's just brilliant. And it's sort of the deductions that, that we need to make. So the Netherlands, tiny country, but responsible for something ridiculous. I think it's the number two by of exporter of food by dollar value, right? So they're growing some real high value stuff, peppers, arugula, veggies, you know, and they're doing it in the dead of winter often, you know, so they're supplying a lot of the continent and elsewhere in the world with these veggies, right? So the greenhouses, they need to stay warm. They do pump the CO2 in there. Obviously they're living on fertilizer. So it's a very expensive operation. And of course, when gas prices went up tenfold, right? Mm -hmm. That's what happened, mm -hmm. went up tenfold because of Russia, you know, Europe did this really crazy thing, which was like, you know, let's let's get into a, a, a you know a war of words and sanctions with this country that supplies most of our natural gas fuel, and oh, let's not top off our tanks before we do that. It was like the most brain dead political maneuver in, at any point mm -hmm. in time. But welcome to Brussels, right? So so, but the impacts of that were fairly easy to predict. So when I was doing my um, early COVID videos. A lot of people found me through that work. I was doing these daily videos starting in January of 2020. And within a couple of weeks, I started ending every one with, hey, plant a garden. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that was me thinking all the way ahead to where we are right now. Um, Cause I know it takes time for people to learn how to grow stuff. You're going to fail for a while. It, da, da, da. So, but I was just ending it with that. And, and uh, my favorite comment, somebody said, I'm beginning to suspect this is the most 3d gorilla gardening channel ever. Right. You know, cause I'm, I'm talking about all this medical stuff and plant a garden. So we are going to enter this next. If I could give people take the energy goggles off, here's your next tool, plant mm -hmm. a garden, because I can tell you that we're going to come into massive food insecurity through bad decision-making, but also just some systemic effects. So right now, Russia and Belarus, and we hopefully we can get into this later. We, there was just some hot action in Belarus um, that we probably should talk about, but Together, those two countries supply 60% of the world's potash. That's the K in the NPK macro fertilizer complex that you would throw on fields or use in your greenhouses. The N in this story is mostly made out of natural gas through something called the Haber-Bosch process, invented right there at the BASF facility in mm -hmm. uh, Germany, right in the heart of it all. And Europe's nitrogenous fertilizer production, last figures I have, is down 70% because there's no government subsidy. There's nobody at Brussels going, this seems important. Let's make sure that plant doesn't close. So the individual plant operators are going, I can't make this stuff and sell it for a profit. So they do the rational thing. They shut the production down. The irrational thing is that there isn't somebody at a higher level looking at that going, yeah, this is a bad idea because um, it's a very easy thought to have. So Europe's nitrogenous fertilizer production is down 70%. Is there enough alternative manufacturers out there who can scale up enough to meet that gap? And the answer is no. So next year, guess what? Prices will go up. Farmers will individually rationalize and not plant things. But most people don't know this. 40% of all food production doesn't come from those big giant agri farms you see. 40% comes from small farms. Yeah. So I was just talking with Michael Yan. He was down in, in um, the Dairy and Gap in Panama, and he's talking with a local farmer, fifth generation. This guy has been there um, planting every year. This guy's like in his seventies now this year for the first time in his small farm where they did basic small farm production. And he always had a surplus to sell. He didn't plant anything this year because mm -hmm. he couldn't afford the fertilizer. Yeah. So that 40% of world food production that comes off of small farms, they are most exposed typically to these price hikes. They can't afford it period. So mm -hmm. then you go over to like the world food organization, right? And you, you see world supply, world demand, and they're never more than the most I've ever seen is 6%. Um, we've, we've, that's the biggest gap. Usually it's two or 3%. Like the world produces this much, consumes this much. It's very tight. So if you took the NPK out of this story, like any one of those three components or worse, all three, you will find food production will go down typically on a typical farm by 20 to 40%. 
40% would be like rice, which is a big staple. You mentioned uh, Sri Lanka, right? But that goes away really fast. If you don't constantly fertilize those rice paddies because it's an aqueous environment, the nitrogen just gets eaten up by microbes and goes away very fast. You have to keep putting that in into that story. You're going to get rice yields, but they'll be down 40%. Remember, mm -hmm. we yeah. only have a 2 or 3% gap, right? So I'm looking at 2023 as being a year where we're going to discover that um, there are just the supply demand gap for food is going to catch a lot of people by surprise. It's going to be really expensive or as you're finding in the UK right now, they're just not even available because they didn't get grown. Like it's not that I, how much do I have to pay to get a pepper? There's none, right? So, yeah. you know, that's a that's where we're going in this story, I think really really yeah. rapidly all right well we could talk for i think another couple of hours chris we've got a lot to cover uh, so that is the end for the public this is the the youtube and a couple of other platforms here where we are not able to talk about some of the other topics that are censored um is simply <laughs> crazy as it is chris in this world they're against the terms and conditions of the platform so uh we either abide by that or we get kicked off. So the rest of this conversation is going to be in the private community. So that's my private community on Patreon. The link is below in the description. Or please go and check out um, Dr. Chris Martinson's uh, Peak Prosperity. He has a private community as well, which will be running the entire interview. And this will uh, just be one of many. We'll do uh, many of these kind of interviews. So uh, thanks so much, Chris, for coming on. We really appreciate you. Uh, thanks a lot. Well, thank you. My pleasure. And it's been just a fantastic conversation. One of many, I'm sure. Yeah, great. We'll see you next time. All right. Take care, guys. God bless.